It is with great pleasure I now get to introduce an extraordinary individual, former Attorney General for England and Wales, and Advocate General for Northern Ireland, and now the Commonwealth Secretary General. I'd like to welcome the Right Honorable Patricia Scotland QC. Madam Secretary General, thank you for being here at Anti-Racism Live. Thank you for joining on such an important day, March 21st. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me once again. I think it's been one of the most important days um, in my life. I've been celebrating or thinking about this day as somebody who watched this, these events unfold um, when I was really young. And I had hoped that perhaps we would be able to no longer be discussing the same issues. But whilst the fight is there, I'm glad we're still fighting it. Your history is long, your story rich. Madam Secretary General, when did you first realize, you first realize there is racism? I think it literally was the 21st of March, 1960. I remember watching these events and being shocked by them because what I saw were children who looked like me being shot at and beaten. And I discovered afterwards the number of people uh, children who were about my age had died. And I remember saying to my father, what is happening? Why are they people doing this? Why do they hate us? And I empathized with those mm. children in South Africa. And I was, I was delighted because my father told me it was wrong. What had happened it was absolutely wrong. And I was thrilled that my father would agree with me because I was barely about five until he said to me then, so what are you going to do about it? And I went, but daddy, I'm only five. And he's turned to me and he said, and your point is? And that was a moment which has actually governed my whole life, has influenced my whole life because uh, what I did at that age, and I used to love fruit, is I decided that I would never eat another piece of South African fruit, and that was the best fruit you could get in the, in the UK at that stage, until South Africa was free. Well, I didn't know it would take 34, five years for that to happen, but I never did eat another piece of South African fruit until it was free. And as I look at what happened on those days and, and the, the pattern that, that racism took, not just in South Africa, but in uh, all over the world, in, in America, even in the UK, much of my career echoed the things that happened. I'm a real child of the Commonwealth. Mm. And I remember so clearly in 1961, when, so it's a year after Sharpsville, when the Commonwealth basically made it impossible for South Africa to stay because it decided that equality of races was a fundamental a principle of the new Commonwealth, which had been created mm -hmm. in 1949 to get away from empire and create mm -hmm. this new construct. And South Africa was forced to leave. And then in 1977, when I first became a barrister at the age of 21, it was in 1977 that we had the Glen Eagles Agreement, where South Africa was was um, uh, uh, the, the, the agreement in relation to sport. So nobody was going to play sport with South Africa because of their racism. And so as I look back, as if my whole life has, has mirrored these issues and the work that I did at the uh, race, um, uh, Racing and Equality Commission and as a lawyer, it's, it's really been a major part of uh, the last 60 years of my life. Madam Secretary General, thank you for sharing that as you've witnessed uh, this part of our history, our recent history, uh, to bring it into context. And another part of that history, and we must give note to that, given that we're in March and it's also Women's History Month, and you have set, uh, you, you, you can pick it if you're watching uh, what barrier the Madam Secretary General has broken, uh, and I will start because it's Women's History Month as well, the first woman to hold the post of Secretary General of the Commonwealth of Nations. And as you grew up at the age of five, realizing what racism is and therefore your own ethnic origin, 
when did you realize, ah, I am a girl, a woman, and that also affects my path? Well, I'm afraid to say that um, I, I lived in uh, the UK in the days when there used to be signs saying uh, no dogs, no Irish and no blacks. And um, the, I was told as I was growing up and going to school that there was a pecking order. And the pecking order was a white male, black male, white female, and black female was at the bottom of the pile. And that everything that I wanted to do was actually not going to be possible because of my color and my gender, which were the two things I didn't want to change and couldn't change even if I wanted to. And so I think I was brought up to, to believe that you are the arbiter of your good fortune and you, you can't affect what other people do to you. You can't stop what they can do to you, but you, all you have control of is your response. Mm -hmm. So when I became a barrister, I think there was 7% of the uh, legal profession in 1977 was female. And of that mm. 7%, about 0.01% were black. Mm. So the profession has changed very dramatically uh, since then. I wish I could tell you that racism and sexism and being subject to the double whammy had gone away, right, right. but regrettably it hasn't. As you look out to those who are looking up to you for what to do in the future, those that uh, are Gen Z, uh, those that are millennial, um, what would you say to them? We have 60 seconds. Thank you, Madam Secretary General. I would say don't give up. This world it will be as you make it. Be bold, be brave, dream the big dreams and then deliver on them because everyone will tell you it's not possible, but it is. Have courage and make sure that this world that you are crafting is so much better than the world that we've left. We know we can do this, but it will take all of us. And thank God, the majority of us are on the same side and we can be the difference that we want to make in this world. And what happened after George Floyd demonstrates that if we stand together in solidarity, the world will be a better place.